Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this panel on current challenges in U.S.-Turkey relations. We've been trying to organize this event uh, for a while now, but it turned out there are really urgent challenges, very serious challenges between the U.S. and Turkey. Uh, within the last week, 10 days, we've seen that in, with, the, with Turkey's Afrin operation. We'll be touching upon that, obviously, we'll be talking about that as, uh, and then see how that actually illustrates the broader challenges in the, in the relationship. Um, with, with, Turk, uh, with President Trump's uh, elec uh, election to the presidency uh, at the, a year ago, uh, Turkey was optimistic and it hoped for a new opening and it hoped particularly that the Syria policy would change. Uh, they were, in, you know, from their perspective, relatively patient. They waited for the U.S. to reconsider um, its, uh, its relationship with particularly the PYD in northern Syria. There was the impending Raqqa operation at that point. Turkey proposed various alternative plans uh, which were not uh, accepted by the U.S. And then basically Turkey was saying, well, we'll talk again after Raqqa is, uh, is over. Um, and Turkey has claimed, you know, there are, there are several promises that were not kept by the U.S. But um, the U.S. continues its presence in northern Syria. And then as we saw, we will discuss this as well, uh, Secretary of State Tillerson uh, sort of gave a new rationale for being in northern Syria for the U.S. forces in terms of confronting Iran. So that's, uh, that's pretty much the mo biggest uh, major change uh, in terms of U.S. policy, perhaps. But uh, I'm laying these out so that uh, our, our uh, panelists could uh, respond. Um, just to my left, uh, Luke Coffey is a director uh, of Douglas and Sarah Allison for Center for Foreign Policy at the Heritage Center, um, Heritage Foundation, sorry. Um, to his left, our, uh, our research director, Dr. Kulic Kanat, uh, and then to his left, Ambassador James Jeffrey, you all know him, Philip Solon's distinguished fellow with the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Um, we want to start from the most uh, urgent question everybody, in everybody's mind with the offering operation, what this means for the relationship. And I want to turn to my colleague, Kulich Kanat. Uh, why don't you tell us uh, in a couple of minutes um, what, what uh, Turkey was hoping to achieve in Afrin and how it led to the most recent uh, uh, crisis that kind of came out uh, yesterday's phone call between President Trump and uh, President Erdogan, uh, there were uh, clearly differences of opinion and differences of perception about what was going on on the ground. So what was Turkey trying to achieve in Afrin? Thank you. I think in a couple of minutes to summarize a few things before we start. It, uh, this is probably the 10th panel that we have been organizing on U.S.-Turkey relations. And each and every time the panelists, uh, if there is no intention to hurt U.S.-Turkey relation, every panelist is trying to be as creative as possible mm -hmm. in order to uh, have a, a positive picture about the future of strategic relations between two countries. And let's start by saying that despite all of these pitfalls, this is a very sophisticated relationship. This has historical ties. And uh, despite some uh, analysts or some people who argue that uh, two countries now have totally different diverging interests, strategic priorities. Two countries are working together in Afghanistan. Two countries are working in Iraq. And yes, despite some uh, who underestimate the significance of NATO, both countries are members of NATO. So this is a solid alliance who are having significant challenges. And those significant challenges are uh, because it, uh, at the beginning it wasn't cons taken seriously and it wasn't handled properly, is creating now strategic divergences in the context of Syria. And part of that reason is increasing ambivalence 
uh, first reason is increasing ambivalence in regards to U.S. alliance relationship around the world. So this is not only regarding to Turkey. In each and every panel, I try to repeat that the, the deprioritization of the U.S. allies have been considered as a significant problem of U.S. foreign policy. And each and every region, U.S. has allies who are having that ambivalence and concerns about the U.S. strategic goal in the coming years and what will happen. And because of this uh, ambivalence, actually, uh, the U.S. allies are looking for alternative diplomatic initiatives, and it's creating some diverg uh, divergent threat assessment for these countries, which is creating uh, significant strategic <coughs> divergences as well. Of course, when you talk with these, when you uh, have a conversation with the national security experts of these countries or the officials, all of them will say that U.S. will be their first priority and U.S. will be their choice to have this kind of strategic relationship. But this ambivalence is creating problem. And in regards to Turkey, for the last <coughs> three years now, almost three, three and a half years, we started to see that there is an increasing divergence in regards to Syria policy. And with the YPG's increase, uh, U.S. support for the YPG, this is getting uh, somehow more uh, dangerous. Of course, despite all of the uh, statements on the U.S. side regarding their uh, uh, regard for the Turkey's national security, all of the nation states, all of the countries would be prepared for the worst when it comes to national security. And all of the countries need to assess what could happen in, a, in the worst case scenario uh, for the national security of that country. There is not much discussion that we need to do about the, that PKK, PKK, YPG, and these are similar groups. These are uh, basically, when you look at the KCK's regulation uh, resolutions as well, it is the same organizations that we are talking about. The recruitment, organizational leadership, ideology, there is no difference between these two organizations. So we don't even need to discuss if the, these are the same organizations or not. So you can understand why it's uh, YPG issue is creating this kind of concern for Turkey. And in regards to Turkey-US relation, there are constant promises either behind the closed doors or public given about the Turkey's concerns about YPG. So YPG was instrumental to defeat ISIS according to US. But since the beginning of this cooperation, US constantly uh, telling Turkish officials that this is tactical, temporary, and limited. And each and every time, Turkey was trying to figure out what does tactical means, what does temporary means, and what does limited means. And there was this kind of, you know, like increasing uh, expansion on the ground. So it was first Kobani, then it became some other regions, most uh, importantly Tel Aviv. then it went to Membich, and then it went to Raqqa, and then it went to Deir Azur. So Turkish side rightfully is asking what will be the end of this cooperation. And we know that Vice President Biden, when he visited Turkey in August 2016, he gave a promise and he basically warned YPG that if they don't move to the east of Euphrates, U.S. may start, stop supporting them. And these kind of promises created expectation on the part of the Turkey. And the uh, lack of fulfilling those expectations and promises is generating a lot of concern, not only in Turkey's security establishment, but among the Turkey's public opinion as well. And as you see with the beginning of the Afrin operation, this was the, the issue of PKK, issue of P YPG, whatever you call, is something that will unite the most, you know, like one, uh, unite Turkey in one of the most polarized, uh, you know, like the period of its history politically. Right now, especially after the Raqqa operation, the concern is more focused on increasing institutionalization of the YPG role in the region. So the, uh, the uh, revenues from the oil, increasing uh, establishment of the local councils, legal establishment and legal institutions by the YPG, and of course the CENTCOM's statement, which was fixed later, but uh, about the border security forces, these are creating confusion and problems about Turkey's perception of the US, at least at the public level, and now at the government level as well. And uh, lastly, one thing we need to uh, understand is another thing that is, I'm telling only the challenges, and Ambassador will probably talk about the opportunities more, but another challenge is together with this, uh, in the last two weeks, what we see is there are different messages, diverging messages from the different 
uh, branches of the U.S. government. So CENTCOM's <coughs> first statement, then Tillerson's statement basically denying any uh, border security forces, then the Pentagon statements about the offering operations saying that they are not interested in offering, it is not their operational area, so it is the Russia-Turkey problem, and then their increasing expressing of concern, and finally uh, the statements from the White House yesterday, which was immediately denied by the Turkish side. These are the issues that is creating a lot of controversy, a lot of confusion among in Turkey at least. So each and every time after a statement comes from State Department or Pentagon, Turkeys are, the Turks are waiting for another statement that would challenge that or that would, if it is going to be parallel with that statement or if it's going to challenge that. And in the alliance relationship, in this lack of certainty is basically generating one of the significant problems. And in the second tour, I can talk a little more about offering. But let me <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll wait to hear yeah. uh, on that more. Um, Luke, um, there's this perception uh, that since Trump administration came to came to power, there was there's been an oversized influence, perhaps of of uh, administration officials with military background. The you know both various offices, the, um, um, DOD and um, the, the you know, CENTCOM, and uh, you see, especially with when it comes to Syria and the Middle East policy, you see, you hear a lot that Trump kind of left it to the generals. Uh, I want to start from there, but of course we want to hear how you think this operation is seen, perhaps with a since you have a military background, from from the perspective of the military, U.S. military. Thank you. Thank um, you. And also thanks to Sita for having me here today. It's always Thank a you. pleasure to speak here in front of this audience. Um, you know, I, I, the, the president has received a lot of criticism about his appointment of retired generals. Mm -hmm. um, but as a former military guy myself, um, I, you know, I, I am comfortable with this because I think if someone serves and they get out and they become a civilian, then they should not be discriminated against simply mm -hmm. because of, the, of their career, a career that often uh, meant a lot of sacrifice as well. So that doesn't necessarily bother me as much. Um, I don't think Trump um, has left the Syria policy to his generals. I think he's left his Syria policy to Obama. Um, <laughs> President Obama um, is the one that his administration, in a desperate move to make it look like they were doing something in Syria, was the administration that decided to um, get into bed with the YPG. And, uh, you know, President Trump has doubled down on this, on this policy. It was very clumsy the way we went about doing this. We thought to ourselves, well, the American public, they want the defeat of ISIS. This is what they want. We need to give them the defeat of ISIS no matter what the cost. Um, so how can we do this? Well, the, the best fighting force on the ground are the YPG. Um, and don't get me wrong, they are very courageous fighters, very competent fighters, regardless of your views on them being a terrorist organization or not, they're very good fighters. So the U.S. decides to arm and equip this group and then really push, push it to the limits um, what this organization um, can do. And now it's, um, you know, fast forward to the Trump administration. They've adopted this wholeheartedly. They have, you know, like I said, doubled down on it. And no one has decided to sit back and look at the second and third order effects of what this policy means. And sometimes I feel like the Trump administration tried to overcompensate to try to finesse this, um, this policy, uh, but it's too late for finesse. Um, these issues, the grievances that the le legitimate security concerns and the legitimate grievances that our NATO ally has um, should have been addressed in the very beginning, and we're trying to play catch up. So. I think that President Trump missed an opportunity to try to take a, a, a different approach uh, when it comes to U.S. support for, for the YPG. I think if you, um, and I've said this actually in this room before, and, and I'll say it again, I think if, if you ask the average American walking on the street um, what they thought about their tax dollars going towards um, supporting a neo-Marxist group with terrorist links to a terrorist organization that has killed NATO soldiers and U.S. civilians at Turkish resorts, um, they would be appalled by this. 
right? But nevertheless, we are where we are. Um, this is the situation we face, and we're still very clumsy. Um, the, we made promises that is outside our ability to keep. For example, we, we tell Turkey, don't worry, the weapons we're providing will not be used against Turkey. The training we're providing, these, this, the, the skills gathered from this training will not be used against Turkey. This is outside the ability of the United States to maintain these promises, right? We've said that the YPG wouldn't go in certain areas, and they are in certain areas. We said the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces, which is merely a cosmetic name change to the YPG, that it would be more representative of the social fabric found on the ground in northern Syria. You have a very small Sunni Arab contingent in the SDF, which is mar heavily marginalized from the decision-making processes, the governing structures of the SDF. And um, I, I, I get why uh, you know, Turkey is concerned. I, I really do. And, um, you know, the biggest concern Turkey has is with that border with Syria. And what does CENTCOM call the force that they're going to create with the YPG? A border force. I mean, it's like we, we, we keep falling into these pit holes, the, these traps, and, you know, we dig the hole deeper for ourselves, and then we have to spin our State Department has to spin its way out of it. And, and there is a lack of coordination um, and this, from the different agencies in the White House, and this isn't um, unique, particularly unique, I would say, to, to the, what's happening in Syria. On the question of Afrin, and I'll, I'll stop here sure. for sake of time, um, I'm actually relaxed about the impact this will have on U.S.-Turkish <coughs> relations. Um, from, a, the, from a military standpoint, I think um, Afrin is going to be a, a heavy lift, a big operation for the, for the Turks and the, um, and the uh, FSA. Um, and it's not going to be um, sort of like the cakewalk we saw with um, the previous operation, Euphrates Shield. And, uh, you know, I think the Turks will, pre will prevail in the end, but I think it's going to be more challenging. And I think it will allow everyone an opportunity, and I hope it will allow everyone an opportunity to take a step back and take a breath and recalibrate where we are in the relationship. It allows President Erdogan and the Turkish people to see that a terrorist threat was addressed and a serious concern about a key part of the Turkish-Syrian border the, these concerns were met through this operation, and it will allow the Americans to look like they're being understanding to Turkey um, by really ignoring the fact that um, that the Turks are going into Afrin, as long as you know they don't cross over to Manbij or any other place where there is a U.S. presence on the ground. And I think the U.S. probably told the YPG that if. Um, if you want our support, then it's going to cost you Afrin. Um, I think that was probably reflected in the statement made by the DOD or someone in the, in the military saying, any YPG supporters that head to Afrin, um, you're not going to have our support anymore. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, the Russian military presence on the ground um, in Afrin makes it that much sweeter for me personally that Turkey is doing this and places um, Russia in a slightly more marginalized position in Syria. So, you know, I'm not losing any sleep over the Turkish military operation in Afrin, and I wish them Godspeed and the best of luck. But it's going to be a challenging operation, and we need to make sure that when Afrin is completed, Ankara and Washington, D.C., take a breath and get back on track and try to get this relationship back on track where it needs to be. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Um, Ambassador, um, Luke talked about how sort of uh, the, the, them being effective fighters, etc. Uh, but, you know, that's, that was actually the underlying thing about my question. When, it's a, when you have the pure military operational perspective, Luke, you can maybe get back to it for the sake of time. Well, I'll go to the ambassador. But there is also political aims of this organization, and they, they don't necessarily see offering all that different uh, for themselves from other areas that they control. Mm -hmm. um, so isn't it uh, problematic to ignore their political ambitions uh, besides their, let's say, military effectiveness on the ground, uh, which, which can be also mm -hmm. questioned, debated, because 
they're known to let go of some of the ISIS fighters before in Raqqa and all that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, please, thank yeah, you. No, obviously, and um, let me also take a step back. First of all, uh, there is no U.S. policy, certainly in Syria, and probably not in Iraq, without the support and thus the coordination of the U.S. and Turkey. It's mm -hmm. that simple. Uh, and ultimately, it's hard for Turkey to operate in those areas without diplomatic, military, mm -hmm. and other support from the U.S. And this support flows on both sides. Uh, the logistical and technical support for the Turkish military, wherever it is, uh, is continuing from Washington. And Washington operates every day into Syria, obviously out of, among other places, Turkey. Uh, so we need to keep that in uh, mind. Secondly, uh, you've got an immediate problem and a far bigger problem that are intertwined in Syria. The immediate problem is for both the U.S. and Turkey, terrorism is a very sensitive issue domestically. It's both sensitive if you get it wrong. Think of the impact of Benghazi on politics here in Washington. Uh, and uh, it's also something that politicians are able to use to show that they are strong, that they are effective, and such. So with the U.S., it's fighting our least favorite group, Daesh or ISIS. For Turkey, it's the PKK. Now, Turkey also has been attacked repeatedly, more than most nations, from Daesh. But on the prioritization of threats, it's the PKK for good reason above Daesh. The U.S., on the other hand, sees Daesh as the bigger uh, threat, but recognizes the PKK as a threat to Turkey and to the alliance and to uh, Europe in various ways. Uh, but So therefore, there is this divergence on which terrorist group is the most immediate. But more importantly, there is a huge problem in Syria that goes beyond Daesh and the PKK and all these names for the terrorist groups. It's Iran and Russia and the Assad regime that have created in this place the most destabilizing uh, development since the year 1979 with the Soviets going into Afghanistan, uh, the rise of Sunni uh, Islamic movements in, uh, uh, specifically in uh, Mecca, and uh, the Iranian Revolution in Tehran. Since then, uh, and that's saying a lot, this is the most uh, dramatic development. That is uh, the... Syrian war, which has given us almost half a million dead, 12 million internally displaced or refugee uh, uh, Syrians, uh, the rise of ISIS, the use of chemical weapons for the first time in 30 years, seriously, uh, a weaponization of refugees uh, to destabilize Europe or as an effect of that, and all of the strains we're seeing now. But also, it empowers terrorist groups. It empowers the PYD. And that was done by the Syrian government, which pulled out of the PYD areas long before the U.S. got on the scene. Uh, and it also empowers the growth of ISIS, either deliberately or because of the way that uh, uh, Iranian surrogates, such as Maliki in Iraq or uh, Assad in Damascus, treat the majority Sunni Arab population in these areas. So the Syrian problem and the related Iranian expansion and the Russian role in entering militarily into the region for the first time since 1973, shot of Afghanistan, uh, are the major problems that both the U.S. and Turkey face. They're not just geostrategic problems in and of themselves that also impact Jordan and Israel and other places. They also feed the whole terrorist agenda. We know the Syrian relationship over the years with the PYD and the PKK. We know how the Iranians and Assad either deliberately or by malchance created ISIS in the first place. So we have, the, so the terrorists, it's not just that they're two separate threats, their threats are tied together. So the U.S. is trying, and this is the difference with Trump uh, and Obama, uh, has decided now that the fight against Daesh is basically completed as a military, conventional military operation, that uh, the U.S. needs to have some impact on the outcome in Syria. That is consistent with Turkey's goals. We heard President Erdogan two weeks ago lashing out in extremely harsh terms, even for him, 
against President Assad. And we know Turkey's un, uh, unease. It works with the Russians because it has to, because it hasn't been able to work with us on so many Syrian issues over the past three years. But there's a, 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 a conjuncture of interest between the U.S. and Turkey on this. So why haven't we done better? Uh, first of all, there is a lack of uh, coordination. I mean, we've all said this in one or another way, but I have never seen it as bad as this between the people in the field. And it's not the military versus civilians. It's the people in the field, including state people, and the people in Washington who have to worry about Turkey, have to worry about bigger problems, and have to worry about the Iranian threat. Uh, that's the first problem. Then there are issues that uh, uh, Dr. Kalic mentioned about the overall uh, problems with the Trump administration, some of which are, are pretty unique to the Trump administration. Uh, but then the third thing is uh, the new policy that Tillerson announced that means that maybe us staying in northeastern Syria and inevitably working with or having a relationship with the PYD slash SDF slash YPG uh, is not a temporary thing because it's part of a larger strategy to try to affect the overall outcome in Syria. That policy was not coordinated with the Turks. It was sprung on them through a variety of announcements and other things, in part because it's not that we're good allies how can we coordinate something with the Turks that we haven't even coordinated within our own government with the U.S. Congress and the American people? Thus, two weeks ago, David Satterfield, the acting assistant secretary uh, uh, for the Near East, was up uh, before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and they kept asking him, uh, who's authorizing you to keep troops on in Syria? Uh, your authorization was uh, under the 2001 uh, uh, fighting al-Qaeda authorization, and if that doesn't obtain anymore, uh, what are you doing there? And he couldn't answer the question. So we have an internal problem here that is impacting in all kinds of way a relationship. Now, we haven't talked about it yet, but I'll just throw it out so that we can then pull it back. There are a whole variety of other issues between the U.S. and Turkey that could be best summed up as legal issues between uh, the Zarab case, um, and uh, Fethullah Gulen and various arrests and various uh, accusations and such. These are very hard to fix, and they don't get, however, to the existential issues in the relationship. What goes on to Turkey's south is existential for Turkey, period, for many reasons. All of these threats together are separate. And uh, is extremely important to the United States because its whole role in the Middle East is being called into question by what's going on, particularly in Syria, and the security of not just one ally, Turkey, but of Israel, Jordan, Iraq, and further afield, the Gulf countries and Egypt, are all being called into question, too. So uh, the U.S. is very engaged. Turkey is very engaged. Our fundamental differences are not that great. Uh, I'll end on one point. Whenever I um, have a discussion with Turks, I say, OK, you're right. PYD equals PKK. I certainly know that. So we'll just leave northeastern Turkey tomorrow. What are you going to do then? One of the most senior officials in the uh, uh, Turkish government, I think one of the two of you were there in that discussion, uh, smiled and said, that's a really good question. Uh, <laughs> and we need to work through those questions. What does Turkey want the United States to do? in concrete terms, uh, and for what purposes. So I'll leave it there. Well, thank you, Ambassador. I want to go quickly to Kulic. Uh, so what does Turkey want to do in Afrin specifically, and can that, uh, how is that going to carry over to the broader northern Syria question? So Turkey is, uh, what Turkey was planning to do in Afrin is actually similar to uh, Euphrates Shield operation, but uh, the use of, diff, uh, there are different operational uh, kind of divergences. So basically to clean out the uh, terrorist organization from its border, which is key, because especially uh, the flow of terrorists from uh, Amanos Mountains to the Mediterranean region of Turkey was always considered as a threat. And since the beginning of the operation, we see that there are rocket fires to Kilis. So it shows that the imminency of the threat for Turkey actually. And it actually proves that Turkey's point that this is not an, a distant threat. This is an immediate threat for Turkey's security. 
However, the operation will have some differences with the uh, Euphrates shield operation. Uh, first of all, the operation is this time, the, uh, in the first operation, we see a higher uh, rate of uh, Free Syrian Army contribution. Mm -hmm. This time, and it was the Special Forces plus Free Syrian Army. This time, uh, Turkish military is engaging in this uh, conflict with uh, its regular army, actually. Mm -hmm. And it shows, the, actually, the improvement of combat preparedness, especially after the July 15 coup attempt. Uh, this is important to show that they are more ready to, for these kind of combats. And uh, secondly, in Afrin operation, uh, in Euphrates Shield, it, there was just one front. And in this, uh, Turkey has four different fronts. Four different fronts means four different military tactics on the ground because of the differences in the territorial domain. Mm -hmm. So uh, most of the Euphrates Shield's operation was taking place in a plain uh, area. But this time, when you look at this, you will see that in the west side, it is a mountainous region. And in the east side, it is much more plain, just like Euphrates Shields. And uh, most of the uh, northern, uh, southern side is through a lot, with a lot of hills, which gives much more strategic high grounds uh, to, be, uh, to get. And which shows that there may be much more tunnels, caves, much more ammunition for the uh, YPG to use. And uh, compared to Euphrates Shield uh, operation, this time Turkish army is facing a more sophisticated group, actually. When you look at that, there are different, especially in the countryside, there are HXP, which is basically the regular army. There is the voluntary army that is in the urban field in Afrin. And there is YPG members who are much more sophisticated and who are controlling the more strategic grounds. And in regards to the end of the operation, uh, what we are seeing right now is Turkey is kind of, in this operation, it is much more open-ended. And they are going really slowly. They are basically moving slowly, carefully. But uh, compared to Euphrates Shields, what we are seeing that there is an increasing degree of uh, loss in the YPG members. Because it is going slowly, you know, like the, many people were telling that this is going slowly than Euphrates Shields. But considering the terrain, considering the sophistication of the YPG in the area and their preparedness for the last couple of years, actually, this is an important issue. And to bring back to U.S.-American relations, this is the important thing is there is a concern that, yes, you know, uh, as Luke said, yes, there may not be weapon transfer from uh, east of Euphrates to west of Euphrates or Afrin. But uh, one of the concerns is the uh, trainers. So uh, U.S. trained a lot of trainers uh, in the fight against Daesh and now ISIS. Uh, and now what will these uh, trainers going to do? Because we know that in Afrin, most of the trainers were coming from PKK, actually, directly from PKK, to train and organize these groups. And one significant problem over there would be who will be these trainers and mm -hmm. what if those trainers will basically sneak from the east of Euphrates to the Afrin and other places and especially if there will be an urban uh, kind of warfare, if they are trying to have an urban warfare, what will be the impact of this? Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, to add one more thing, uh, when I'm saying public opinion is sensitive, it's important that when uh, it may be uh, planned earlier, but it is important then when Turkey was having this fight and there is kind of, you know, national unification, when uh, Brad McGurk is in Kobani at the same time and Wotel is in Raqqa at the same, you know, like the period, maybe that's, that may be an accidental, you know, uh, uh, coincidence, but it gives, especially sharing those pictures on Twitter, gives really wrong signals in Turkey. Luke, I raised that question about uh, your initial remarks, uh, the political aims, differences between political aims and the military operations. And Kulich mentioned this, uh, you know, organization sort of uh, having their trainers travel throughout the region. We know like they moved from Turkey as well to northern Syria. So how does how does the military sort of manage that when it's in a partnership like this maybe you can think of other examples um, and like how how would they manage that and how that impacts the policy uh, the broader policy because I understand from the Santcom's perspective they need to defeat ISIS it's a military operation and that's that they accomplish their mandate 
But then when it carries over to these broader political problems, including confronting Iran as an ambition, U.S. Uh, sort of policy, uh, how, how does that play out on the ground uh, yeah. operationally? Well, um, as I pointed out um, in, my, in my opening mm -hmm. remarks, uh, you know, the, the PYD is a neo-Marxist organization which, which goes against the ideological views of, I would say, a vast, vast, vast majority mm -hmm. Of Americans and having spent time in the US Army I'd say about a hundred percent of those serving in the United States Army with the odd exception here or there um, so but, but this is actually secondary to um, the, the broader um, goals for the United States and Syria I'm not saying this is right I'm not saying it, sh it should be secondary but the reality is mm -hmm. it is secondary President Trump or any politician for that matter associated um, with the administration wants to be able to say on the campaign trail heading into the next presidential election and brace yourselves we're only about a year away from the campaigning season starting again believe it or not um, they want to say look I defeated ISIS mm -hmm. Americans don't care about the neo-marxist ideological beliefs of the PY, uh, y, the PYD or the YP, YPG they don't I mean they don't uh, care about this, and they, mm -hmm. but they do care about ISIS being defeated. But this doesn't mean that policymakers should ignore such matters. Um, there will be consequences to this. We're already seeing it in local governing structures inside northern Syria that don't reflect, um, you know, like I said, the social makeup on the ground. Um, if if the, the way the YPG and the PYD are governing in northern Syria, if it's not done um, properly, if it's not done in the correct fashion, it will plant the seed for ISIS 2.0. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and this is something that the U.S. needs to keep a very, very close eye on. In terms of the question about trainers, um, the, the U.S. in the statement about weapons going to Afrin um, also mentioned, I think, personnel, too, mm -hmm. saying, you know, if, you're, if you go there, you're on your own. Um, and the, the model for U.S. Um, for the U.S. military, especially U.S. Special Forces, is to this train the trainer concept. Mm -hmm. You know, train the the local forces so then they can go on and train more, and it's more sustainable and enduring that way. But I can tell you, the last time you want to start training and worry about training is when you're engaged in a fight, like the YPG is against the Turks. So um, I'm not sure. You know, if it's, if this stagnates and prolongs for several months or years maybe the trainers could have an impact but if it's a relatively shorter operation than you know measured in weeks or, or months but not years then I'm not sure the trainers would have that much impact or not. Yeah, let, let me just Thank comment you. on the yeah, trainers a bit because it, it gets also to the weapons transferred up uh, and you have to be careful on this because at a certain level of uh, novice recruits almost any training is rather similar uh, but the uh, YPG is a pretty sophisticated military organization. The training they got from the United States was uh, to uh, go on offensive operations in urban areas and to deal with a lightly armed insurgent yeah. force in a relatively open area. And there were very specific uh, tactics and such that they were trained in and there were weapon systems that they were given, such as the most obvious one that everybody cites is the armored Humvees. Uh, these tactics are not going to help you in a mountainous area against a mechanized force such as the Turkish army. Uh, they are very different tactics that you use against that. So the idea that well, we've trained them up so that they can fight against the Turks, I'm sorry, it's a different kind of army. It's a different kind of situation. And it's one of the biggest issues right now in the U.S. Army and Marine Corps is getting people to learn how to train for a conventional war when you've spent 15 years uh, on a war like fighting ISIS. So that's the first thing. And to some degree, it's the same thing with the uh, weapons. Uh, th there's not a Humvee in the world that threatens the Turkish army because, you know, uh, even light or heavy machine guns can uh, uh, shoot up a Humvee as somebody who spent a lot of time in one. They're not ever particularly safe or effective vehicle, unless you're fighting ISIS guys with Kalashnikov. So, I mean, there's a little bit of uh, hyperbole in the Turkish accusations against this. Well, um, I want to open it to questions. We don't have a lot of time, uh, but I wanted to actually ask you, Ambassador, how, how if the Iran, you, you're somebody who talked about confronting Iran a lot mm -hmm. and the need for cooperation with mm -hmm. Turkey on this, so if Tillerson's uh, 
statement becomes reality and uh, the U.S. is actually there, going to stay there against Iran. Uh, and it seems that the nat natural conclusion there is we're going to work with PYD against Iran. Is there a way to use the PYD against any kind of Iranian interests? I, don't, I do not think there is anybody who thinks the PYD is going to go off after the Iranians or even the Syrian government. Essentially, the Americans need a platform. Mm -hmm. If we at some point want to put more pressure on Syria, the answer is to reverse the Trump administration decision to stop arming the Free Syrian Army. There are lots of, in the area around uh, uh, Mambich, in the area around Raqqa, there are lots of people who are associated with the Free Syrian Army or have relatives or friends associated with the Free Syrian Army. Uh, there's a lot of people, as you know, in exile in uh, Urfa and other places in Turkey. Mm -hmm. So that's what the U.S. would do. It means that it's not, it, it shifted. The PYD was our infantry against Daesh. Daesh. The region of the Northeast is the platform for the U.S. to figure out under which ways, militarily, diplomatically, it can pressure the Assad regime, and particularly the Russians, who are the key players here, to come up with a solution to Syria that does not empower an expansionist Iranian uh, regime. But this isn't fighting the Iranians either directly or indirectly. Thank you, Ambassador. I want to open it to questions, um, and I'll collect them, uh, make sure they're all answered. Uh, anybody have questions in the audience? Please, back there, here, and here. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Alan Makovsky, Center for American Progress. Um, I wanted to uh, pick up on Ambassador Jeffrey's point at the end of his talk. If your dialogue with the Turkish official what would you do if the U.S. left uh, Northeast Syria? Um, and I guess maybe I'd direct it to anyone I'm thinking of, Kalich, but, uh, excuse me, uh, why do you think it's related? Why do you think uh, Turkey has not asked the U.S. to leave Injerlik, given the tension um, between the two? And also, if I could just quickly add, if somebody has information about the demo pre-war demography of Afrin, I'd be interested. Is it truly a uh, primarily a Kurdish area? Yes, right here. Yeah, uh, isn't it a little misleading to talk about the Kurds as if they're a monolithic block? Mm -hmm. uh, we've been <laughs> talking about the PYD and the YPG as if they were coterminous. Um, the uh, Turkish government, I believe, is presently in negotiations with the uh, Kurdish autonomous region in Iraq about exporting oil through Turkey. Mm -hmm. Are there Kurds in northern Syria that the uh, Turkeys find acceptable to work with? Mm -hmm. And right here. Hi. Uh, it, depending on whose numbers you believe, this year Turkey's population is probably going to exceed Germany. Uh, they probably already have the second largest land army in NATO. Isn't there some sense that Turkey's, in the next 10 years, is going to start to sort of outgrow its just another NATO membership uh, position? Outgrow NATO membership position, you yes. said? Okay. Any Anything else? I just want to save some time. Ambassador. Um. And let's say, let's also say it's tripled its economy in the last 15 years. Turkey isn't, uh, but still, Turkey has been able to do all of this because it has a whole series of security, cultural, and economic and trade relationships with the West. This is why Turkey is basically, my assessment, a status quo country. It does not have the tools that Iran has and that Russia have uh, and the mindset to be expansionist in the way Russia is in its narrow broad, and Iran is particularly using Shia populations throughout the region. There are specific reasons why these countries are relatively successful at being expansionist and see status quo countries, and that I don't see Turkey being such. And Turkey is doing so well by basically just resting within Turkey. 
uh, and uh, nurturing these relationships. Uh, in terms of Alan's question, again, um, essentially there's just four things that can happen to northeastern Turkey. Uh, Northeastern Pardon? Northeastern Syria. Northeastern Syria, yeah. Uh, we leave and the Turkish military goes in, so multiply the Afrin operation by 100 or 500, given the number of people there. And, uh, you know, uh, Euphrates Shield was a cakewalk until uh, the Turkish army got to Al Bab. Seventy-four Turkish troops were killed uh, in a several-month-long battle. I mean, it's really hard taking terrain. We've experienced this ourselves in these areas. Uh, the people who dig in are hard to dig out, and we're talking about a huge chunk of Syria. So, uh, one option, which I don't think is palatable to Turkey, is to go in and occupy it themselves. Second one is allow. Assad and the Iranians and the Russians to somehow go in, and now they have an army, the PYD, uh, who they've used in the past in its PKK uh, cloture against Turkey. Then you've got, uh, we stay in in some kind of coordinated way with Turkey, or we stay in in constant spats with Turkey. I prefer the third of the four options. Ambassador, in one of those conversations, actually, some really highest level official said, Our, we don't have a problem with U.S. presence itself. Uh, just to perhaps yeah. uh, add to your point, I think it, it's, it's got to do more with uh, the relationship with the PYD. In, than, empowering the than, PYD and mm -hmm. making the mistake we made with the Kurdistan regional government where suddenly they were claiming mm -hmm. all of Kirkuk as part of their territory, and we saw what happened there. Mm -hmm. Kuluc, pre-war demography in Afrin and acceptable Kurds in northern Syria questions, maybe. A couple things. Uh, about the uh, earlier point, if you don't mind, to add sure. something about the, uh, the trainer thing. So the sensitivity in Turkey, especially among the public opinion, is so high right now that the technical details usually goes on the radar. And when you say that there are trainers of uh, a terrorist organization, it has trained, and that those who are trained may train some others, that would be enough to create concern and uh, certain level of anxiety among the public opinion, local population, or those who suffered from the uh, PKK attacks. And uh, the statements of the uh, State Department and Pentagon constantly mention that there should be, the focus should be defeating Daesh. Mm -hmm. And it's creating, uh, you know, like the really uh, anger in Turkey because yeah. when you compare to the terrorist attacks that happened since 2015 against Turkey, you will, say, you will see that, yes, Daesh created a lot of, uh, organized a lot of terrorist attacks, but PKK organized more terrorist attack than Daesh. And the destructive force of PKK was worse, actually. So when the U.S. side keeps saying that let's yeah. focus on Daesh, it kind of uh, sounds like increasing insensitivity and lack of understanding to national security concerns. Of, the, of all the sure. stupid things we've done, you've put your finger on the stupidest thing that comes out in every statement of, let's continue our joint effort against our priority, which is Dash. Turkey hasn't signed up to that. You're right. Does that relate to the Injerlik question, too? That because Injerlik, uh, I mean, the operations are against ISIS, so... The, it's still going on. The Euphrates Shield, you know, like the both uh, Jarablus and uh, El Bab was uh, basically controlled by Daesh. So it is the primary target was over uh, there was Daesh. Mm -hmm. And one more thing, we have to understand that PYD uh, and PKK, you know, like the, in, the cons in the perception of Turks, it is the same organization. So one is, can be an external threat, but PKK is an internal threat. So training trainers of an internal threat may create controversy. Mm -hmm. And not all of the PKK, uh, YPG members were seasoned PKK fighters. Especially at the beginning of the Kobani, we see that there was a huge recruitment process organized by PKK to find uh, basically inside members for, Turkey. Yeah, inside, inside Turkey. Turkey to members in, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, members of PKK uh, trying mm -hmm. to recruit more members to YPG. And uh, secondly, of course, it is not the monolithic element. And that was the Turkey's argument from the very beginning. So when Turkey was actually uh, talking with the Kurds in Syria, they, invited, they were invited to be part of the Syrian National Council. They invited to be part of this uh, opposition. But however, the uh, organization created a monopoly of power. 
and with the U.S. assistance, they got the uh, legitimacy at the same time. And yes, now each and every commentator is talking about how hard they fight, but they never fought without the support of the U.S. Air Force so far. Right? The Alfred operation will be the first operation that they are not getting any support of the uh, U.S. Air Force. And it would be important now to see what was the real capability of the organization. Luke. Um, I, I believe, um, I'm sure there are people in this room who know far more about the, the demographics of northern Syria than I do, but I do believe that um, Afrin is a majority uh, Kurdish region. Uh, in fact, I think it, it was one of the most densely populated Kurdish regions in northern Syria, but I would double check that. I'm being very honest. You know, normally you come up here and you just spout things off, hope no one checks. Uh, so double check that before you use it if, if you do for anything. Um, with, with NATO and Turkey and the United States, look, we've had 70 great years or so of, of strong relations. Um, I'm not willing or ready to throw it away for seven challenging years um, uh, as we see now. And I, I'm very optimistic about the, the, the NATO, U.S., Turkish relationship um, in the future. I think on the big issues, our, our, um, our interests are aligned. And, uh, you know, you're right, Turkey's population is growing. It's becoming a stronger regional actor, second largest army in NATO. Um, this, is, this is great for the U.S., in my opinion. We need a strong Turkey that's a regional leader, um, that, strong arm, that strong Turkey that's a regional leader. We, that, that military, you know, Turkey is... One of the largest troop contributors still in Afghanistan. It's the only country other than the United States that's commanded ISAF twice in Turkey. Um, it has great relations with many other U.S. allies in the South Caucasus. Uh, so I, I think that once we get through this, this challenge we have now, we're going to go back um, you know, to hopefully how things used to be. If there's one more question, I can take it uh, right here. Herb Rose. Um, it has been alleged by some that in the aftermath of the coup, uh, the, um, the officer staff of the Turkish army has been, uh, I won't use say gutted, but has significantly diminished. So when you talk about uh, Turkey having the second largest <coughs> army in NATO, um, is that really uh, sum up its capabilities uh, in some of its goals in Syria and elsewhere? That's a, that's a point actually that I've made on numerous occasions since the aftermath of the coup. Um, without a doubt, if you remove roughly one third of your general officers and a large sizable chunk of your field grade officers, you are gonna have a readiness problem. I mean, that goes without saying. Now the question is, since the coup, since then, has Turkey been able to fill this gap? Have they been able to accommodate in such a way that has mitigated the impact of the readiness issue that they must have had? Um, and I think Afrin will be a good, um, a good case study of this. Um, it's a conventional land force being involved in not only urban combat, mountainous combat, um, you know, open field maneuver warfare, uh, so it will be a good test to see um, how, how the Turkish armed forces have, have coped w with this. But, you know, the Turkish military is very professional um, and, and is um, well respected, and I, I think that they can overcome mm -hmm. sort of these challenges. Kulich, last uh, closing remarks. Uh, closing remarks, just uh, to say about the, uh, just to add a few things. Uh, the operation will show, but especially the uh, one of the, uh, especially during the Euphrates Shield, there was uh, questions, especially in the Western media, about the capability of Turkish air forces, and especially during the Elbab operation, there was some questions about the logistics to provide logistics for the troops over there, so that they can do the clean and sweep operation effectively mm -hmm. and hold the uh, territory for the uh, uh, Free Syrian Army or the Turkish forces. And in this operation, what we see is in the first couple of uh, days, we see 72 uh, jet fighters, F-16 actually joined the operation. So it's kind of, you know, like at the same, it's important that they targeted, you know, like the one, uh, 113 different targets. 
and eliminated 108 of them. And they were considering when uh, the commentators, especially national security correspondents, were telling that it's a, you know, in, in a very short, in a very limited area, actually, to have these huge operations with 72 planes is kind of, you know, showing that they are, uh, they become combat ready again, uh, in at least at uh, pre-July uh, 15 level. And as uh, Luke said, the uh, operation is important to, and it will show because, as he mentioned, there are different forces and different asymmetric forces on the ground together with some frontal army that the Turkish military army may face. And, uh, and this time it is the regular army and this operation itself will show whether Turkey is, you know, like the basically uh, uh, fix the wounds that it got from the uh, July 15 coup attempt. Ambassador, I want to end with you. Tell us something more. Uh, no, I, I, was just, I, I was just how smiling. To, how to get out no, of, nobody, how to no, get out of this. Nobody, not the Israelis, the Russians, or the U.S. coalition has put 72 airplanes uh, into the air over Syria at one point up till now. And I'm trying to think of, hmm, how many aircraft does the Russians have in Syria? I'm sure that everybody noticed that. I mean, there are all kinds of games going on here. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the area we're talking about, the Hatay and its bordering areas, that's where, of course, the Russian airplane was shot down. Uh, there's the whole Idlib operation just to the south we haven't talked about. There are all kinds of games within games going on here. And uh, until the U.S., which is the theoretically most powerful player, actually comes up with a very specific clear policy that it runs by and gets by off by the Turks on, uh, we're going to see continued confusion because it's too important for Turkey to allow anybody to go off on his or her own, be it us, the Israelis, the uh, Arabs, or uh, Iran or Russia uh, in that region. And that's basically just a fact of life. Well, um, I want to thank our panel, but, you know, this we were hoping to discuss broader issues, but in such a short amount of time, we talk mostly about uh, the northern Syria. I guess instead of current challenges, we talked about <laughs> the current challenge. It is the current but, uh, challenge. Yeah, it's a good but challenge. I want to thank you all for being here, uh, participating. Uh, I, please join me in congratulating my panel.